Jim Quick, welcome back. It's always such an honor to get to chat with you. Katie, it's so good to be here. I'm such a big fan of you and a big fan of your show. Well, likewise, I've learned so much from you and from all of your courses and content and books. And we've had some awesome conversations in the past that I will link to in the show notes for foundation for anybody who hasn't listened to them already. But I love every conversation we have because I feel like I always get really practical things that I can take away that make a really big impact in my life and especially my learning, which I think personally is one of the keys to health and longevity is to maintain our love for learning. Yeah. And it's something I talk about so much with parents and with my own kids and why even our education is focused on really nurturing their creativity and their love for learning rather than just fitting them to a system of bookwork. And I feel like you have such a fascinating story of how you've learned all the things that you teach and your approaches are so um, amazing. You have this new book called Limitless. And I'd love to just start broad, maybe any areas of your background that you want to just kind of go through as an overview for people who may not be already familiar with you. And then maybe um, give us an intro into Limitless and what you learned through the writing of that book. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think my my purpose is to, well, I felt very limited. Let's make it start there. My inspiration was my desperation, a series of traumatic brain injuries, learning challenges, and some people call um, certain disabilities growing up what well, was a challenge. Um, and because of it, I had issues around uh, belief in myself and esteem issues and confidence issues. I was like paralyzed by the thought of being called on in class and took me an extra few years to learn how to read. And I somehow, you know, through in elementary school, got this label of as the boy with the broken brain. And that was kind of my, my identity. Um, you know, having been able to go and go from maybe a below normal, whatever normal happens to be to that normal to uh, doing the things that I'm doing now. I'm just very passionate about, I would say, redrawing the borders and boundaries of what's possible. I mean, I really want to offer real hope and help to anyone who's was in this similar place, anyone who was called uh, limited in, in some way, you know, told that they weren't enough and um, and showing them really the, the power um, that they really have and the potential that they could access by uh, learning a little bit more about the thing I'm very passionate about, which is the human brain. And so I've made it my mission to build better, brighter brains, no brain left behind. And how we do it is through our podcasts, um, through our online courses, uh, through speeches, I get to address and this is weird for someone who has was phobic of public speaking. I could be in, maybe in front of a quarter million people a year in total, maybe even three continents in, in one week, as you and I were just talking about right before we started recording. And, um, you know, I really do believe adversity could be an advantage that um, through challenge comes change, that through our struggles, we find strength. And so, um, yeah, this is my over, I've been doing it for over 30 years now. And uh, as a as a brain coach, if you will, kind of like a personal trainer, is like a physical coach, a coach for your body, it makes you stronger, more flexible, more agile, give you, helps you uh, create more endurance, more energy. Well, I want um, I want your mental muscles to be sharper. I, I want your your um, mental endurance to, to be to be stronger. I want your memory to be um, you know enhanced and and so much more. So. Um, and I, if you might hear some of my dogs in the background, <laughs> um, and. Uh, yeah. And so I'm, I'm very passionate about helping people of all ages and stages. Um, and because I've been doing it for you know a few decades now, I believe genius leaves clues that it's not how smart you are um, or how smart your kids are. It's more, how are they smart? And, um, and so I'm really passionate about helping people discover and develop their, their innate intelligence. That's one of the things I love so much about your story and about your approach is that really delving into the uniqueness of each person's genius. And I think that's where often I find holes in the education system is it, of course, has to take into account so many children, which leads to a lot of sort of averaging and catering to everyone. Um, and it's been really fun, even just with six kids, to see how unique and different they each are and how their genius lies in in different areas and to get to hopefully help them really cultivate that and um, to keep, as I learned from you so much, that love of learning as, yeah. as so important to them and that curiosity. And I think your story is so incredible and gives so much hope because knowing you now, it's hard to ever believe that you struggled with learning and memory and all these things because I've seen you in front of crowds, first of all, looking effortless at public speaking, but second of all, being able to remember really complex series of numbers and all kinds of things, and then even remember them backwards instantly. And 
I certainly always leave inspired every time I hear you speak and uh, every time I read your work and we've used your courses for parents listening. I've used your courses with my kids as well, mm -hmm. because I really do think, um, you know, th that love of learning and maintaining that as we get older is a superpower, which you talk about so much. And so I think especially in today's world where access to information is almost unlimited, it's no longer about memorizing facts or just being mm -hmm. able to get through worksheets and checklists. It's about learning how to learn and learning how to adapt quickly. And I think that's what's so beautiful in your approach. And I love your new work as well, because you talk about brain health from several different angles. So to start off broad, can you kind of walk us through some of those keys to what you call limitless brain health? Yeah, absolutely. And you were mentioning, you know, with your six kids, everyone learns differently. And I, I'm wearing a shirt. If people are watching this on, on video, it, it says neurodiversity, which is this idea that people experience and interact uh, with their world in many different ways. And there's no one, you know, quote unquote, right way of thinking or of learning or behaving. And these differences are not viewed as, as necessarily deficits. Um, you know, and when you mention our, our courses, and we have, we have students in every country in the world, you know, 195 nations, so we have a lot of data, and uh, we teach people more, more of the software, if you will, uh, metaphorically, how to read faster, how to focus, how to remember things, how to do better in school. Um, but the hardware you have to take care of also, right, which is, you know, the actual physical uh, performance of, of this brain that we have, you know, and our ability to learn and to be able to relearn or maybe even unlearn uh, is so very important. Um, things that we recommend in terms of having a limitless brain are, um, well, we know that in, in the work is my work, uh, the limitless was endorsed by like the founding director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Brain Health by the top Alzheimer's researcher at a Harvard University. We know approximately, you know, uh, this one third of our, of our brain is performance is predetermined by genetics and biology, leaving at least two thirds in our control. And there are 10 things that I really focus on specifically uh, to be able to optimize that. And these are all things you've had experts come in to talk about. Um, quick summary, and I would recommend as I go through this rather, rather rapidly, uh, quick if style, if you will, is to make it practical for everybody is maybe they could, you know, I encourage people to take some notes um, that helps with the forgetting curve, but maybe assess yourself, you know, maybe even something simple, like as you're taking notes on a scale of zero to 10, how much energy or effort or attention are you putting towards this category? Because everyone wants like the one thing. And I really don't think that there's a magic pill as so much there is uh, processes. And so, um, in no specific order, uh, let's start with a, a good brain diet. You know, you are what you eat. Uh, what you eat matters. Uh, what you eat and absorb matters, especially for your gray matter. Uh, area of science called uh, neuronutrition. That's earned, uh, that your brain is only maybe 2% uh, of your body mass, but it requires 20% of the nutrients. And some of the nutrients that your brain requires is different than the rest of your body. Um, I like to get most of mine through, through food. Um, that's my, uh, and, and it's hard because everyone is, a, is bio-individual. So I'll, I'll state that. I don't think there's, you know, one thing that's good for somebody that's, you know, that could be something not so great for somebody else. Um, you know, so foods that I personally eat are things like avocados for the amount of saturated fats. Um, I, I, I love blueberries. I could eat them all day. I call them brain berries. Um, you know, green vegetables like like broccoli, uh, kale, uh, spinach. I know some people talk about the the hormesis uh, in terms of some of the things that are in vegetables that are protective of protecting them from from danger. Um, but I do things like you know cold and heat and do certain things purposely. Um, the, if people's diet allows, um, that the the choline in eggs is good for for cognitive health. Um, your brain is mostly fat, so I like to incorporate some wild. Uh, salmon, maybe some sardines, um, a little bit of uh, turmeric here there for some flavor and, uh, you know, inflammation, lower inflammation benefits. Um, dark chocolate uh, is so important. And a lot of these things I could put even in a smoothie, you know, and with probably not the salmon, <laughs> um, but it's just something that's nutritious and delicious. I mean, obviously we know a lot of things to stay away from highly processed foods, uh, the, the seed oils, um, it's sugar. Oh my goodness. Um, and so a scale of zero to 10, um, our good brain diet. Um, number two, uh, killing ants. I got this phrase from uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, a mutual friend of ours, automatic negative thoughts. And, um, I believe that our, our beliefs are things that all behavior is belief driven often at events where I'm doing these demonstrations, people will grab me afterwards and say, Jim, I just have a horrible memory. I'm getting too old. I'm not, I don't think my kid's 
smart enough. I tell you, I say, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, right? And your brain is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk is the program that will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering things, I'm not good at remembering names, you won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to. So I believe all behavior is belief-driven and that our mind is always eavesdropping on our self-talk. Um, not to say that you have one negative thought and it ruins your life any more than eating that one donut will, but I think the consistency and the habit of saying certain things uh, could affect us uh, in a very deep way. And so on a scale of zero to 10, how positive and encouraging our thoughts. Um, number three, and I know you talk about this a lot and have guests talk about it, is just movement. Um, they say sitting is a new smoking. Uh, I find that What's so important for me is as I work, I do some deep work, maybe 90 minutes um, in cycles, 90 minutes throughout um, sessions. And um, I, t I tend to stay like time chunk things where I focus on one activity. I don't want to just keep on going back and forth or try to do these this task switching where I'm turning on a certain a cognitive web in my mind and then switching this another one and then it takes a lot of energy. But during a, a brain break, I'll take time to hydrate. I'll take time to um, to do some deep breathing. Um, and then I'll take time to move. And I, I, I just, I have to, I don't know what it is. I have to get in my steps each day. It's something that works for me every morning. I have to do like a good 30 minutes, um, you know, usually around zone two, uh, cardio. And I just feel like it helps me sleep better. I feel like it helps me think clearer. Um, the, the fresh, you know, uh, air and the sunlight is, uh, you know, is very supportive also, but, um, so I don't mean necessarily Pilates three times a week or CrossFit. I mean, just like how much are we moving throughout the day? You know, as your body moves, your brain grooves, you know, when you exercise, you build a brain derived neurotropic factors, which people say is like miracle grow or fertilizer for neuroplasticity. Uh, we know there are studies done when people are listening to your podcast, uh, or they'll maybe listen to an audiobook and they're doing something rhythmic, like they're on an elliptical or a cycle, or they're they're going for a walk, that they'll understand it better and retain it better also as well. Um, so a scale of zero to 10 is movement. Um, number four is nutrients, brain nutrients. And again, I prefer to get it through um through through my diet personally. But um you know, it's, uh, maybe we need a supplement also as well, especially in the lifestyle that we have, which is really, you know, it's often fast paced and ever changing. Um, I would always go to the experts and you've had many of them on your show. And, uh, and I love to pick your brain on, you know, certain nutrients that maybe you find is, is useful for um, stress management or focus, um, uh, memory or more mental energy. Um, also, it, uh, you know, but I also remember testing, right? Go to a functional medicine doctor um, and do a microbiome test, a, a nutrient profile and see what we could be lacking. You know, if you're lacking certain B vitamins or D, uh, you know, your omega threes, that could, could definitely compromise your ability to, to be mentally there. Um, so that's number four. Uh, number five is, uh, and I'm going through rapid fire, is a positive peer group. You know, you've heard this phrase in self-improvement, who you spend time with is who you become. Um, that we are the the average of the five people we spend time most time with. That you're around four broke people. Be careful because you're on your way to be number five. And um, you know we have these mirror neur neurons in our nervous system, which is allows us to feel empathy. If you're watching something like sports, or you could kind of feel what the character is going through in the movie you're watching or the show you're watching. Um, your mirror neurons are turned on just like kids, and we tend to imitate. Um, I always say watch W A T C H. We tend to imitate people's W as their words, their language, uh, we are the people around us. The A are the actions. We tend to behave like the people around us that we spend time with. The T are the thoughts. And we talked about how thoughts really are things. The C is our character. I, I heard this uh, quote recently. I don't know who to attribute it to. Um, but they said, integrity is measured by the distance between someone's lips and their life the distance between someone's lips and, and their life. And I think it's better well done than well said for sure. But we tend to um, uh, mod model our character around the people we spend time with. And then um, that's the the C and the H finally are habits. And we know that first you create your habits and then your habits create you. Um, you know, you create your habits of meditation, uh, of exercise, of journaling, or, you know, eating the best, you know, nutritious foods ever. And those habits create you back. Um, so positive peer group is so important. We all need people to encourage us, to challenge us, to cheerlead for us. And if you haven't found that person yet, or those people, I would recommend be that person for somebody else. 
especially to be that person for ourselves. I think part of self-care is not just, uh, you know, uh, necessarily going to the spa and doing those things, but maybe it's putting borders and boundaries around the things that you hold important in your life, you know, your time, your energy, your emotions, your, your heart. And part of it, self-love is falling in love with that person in the mirror that it's been through so much, but is, is still standing, you know? And I, so I think sometimes we don't credit ourselves with how far we've come in the process. And so I think self-love is important, but going back to positive peer group, it's not just our neurological networks or our biological networks, it's also our social networks. Like whether or not somebody uh, smokes has less to do with their biology and more to do with does their friend smoke or their friend's friend smoke. So that's number five. Um, number six is a clean environment. And this is something I'm putting extra focus on, you know, of recent, but just, I think our external world is the reflection of our internal world often. And we know that when we make our bed or we clean off our desk or we clean, you know, we file the folders on our laptop, we have clarity of, of thought also as well. And so I think it's important to Marie Kondo our mind <laughs> that if sometimes if you're in a messy environment, you, it takes energy uh, and memory to be able to retain where everything is. And, um, and so, it, you know, why use that excess energy um, and processing for that when, when you don't need to? So that's number six. And then finally, seven, eight, nine, ten. Seven is a big one, again, that you covered on your podcast. And I, I met your podcast a lot because I'm, I'm an avid listener and our team listens to it also as well. My business partner is always sending me episodes. Um, sleep, right? And especially when it comes to our brain health. That, um, And this is something I have intimate uh, experience with. Um, for five straight years in my, and as an adult, I slept uh, 90 minutes a night in total. Uh, not even uh, straight, but very interrupted. I ended up um, being diagnosed with um, severe sleep apnea where I stopped breathing 250 times a night and each time counted as like 10 seconds. So that's what an episode was. If I stopped breathing for at least 10 seconds, they would count it. And there was over 250 episodes a night on average. And so I would wake up suffocating and I would use a CPAP and a dental device and you know all these different things and, and nothing really worked. Um, I had this surgical procedure at UCLA with a head of throat over there, and they did something called the U-triple-P, which they took out my uvula, my soft palate, uh, my tonsils, and and my uh, my sleep jumped up to four hours, you know, which is not a lot of sleep, but it's remarkably more than, than 90 minutes. Um, but going back to sleep, I have since improved it with, uh, with various recommendations um, from uh, sleep experts and coaches, which, which I have many. Um, but everybody, again, they have, I think there's a gift in every challenge, just like there was, a, you know, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning and public speaking, and they became my strengths. Um, you know, I think there's a gift also in not sleeping. Uh, and on a side tangent, I think one of them is um, it forced me to double down on everything I teach. You know, I, I, I'm an avid reader and uh, focused, but I, everything that I teach is something that I use personally because I was at such a deficit. You know, every single thing was impaired because um, that's what happens when you don't sleep. Every biological function gets impaired and, and reduced. So it forced me to really get good at what I do um, and live what I teach I think, and practice what I post, right? Um, but the other thing is that the other gift in there was I became extremely good at uh, controlling my time and my commitments, because when you feel like you have a limited amount of energy because you're not sleeping or limited with a bandwidth of focus, attention, alertness, you don't overcommit. And so everything in my life really is heck yes or heck no. And, um, you know, I don't have too many tabs open, which I think a lot of people struggle with, with brain fog or mental fatigue, just because it's stress induced, uh, because they have so many uh, commitments. And just like, and I mentioned a lot of books, like Good to Great, Jim Collins, that good is the enemy of great. That when you say um, yes to something, you're not saying no to yourself. And so like right now, Katie, there's nowhere, no one else I'd rather be talking to right now, nowhere else I'd rather be because my commitments are very clear. Because um, I think a lot of energy is being used up where, you know, we have this image of, you know, who we're projecting out there. We have this image who we, you know, fear we are. And we have this, you know, our accurate self-image. And it takes so much energy to be able to manage all that. And so um, it's nice when you have like a level of alignment or congruency. And that came out of a deficit. Of, of sleep. So, you know, we, I, in our, we've done multiple episodes on sleep optimization, as you have, uh, we had dedicated a whole chapter in Limitless on that, because when you're not sleeping, 
um, you know, you're not forming uh, long-term memories. Uh, that's where you consolidate short to long-term memory, uh, clear out the, the sewage system uh, kicks in when you're, when you're sleeping in, in your brain to help with reduce uh, that beta amyloid plaque. You also dream, which is an incredible resource. Um, we talk a lot about remembering your dreams and, and uh, some powerful ideas that have come in throughout history, art, science, literature, inventions that came out of dream states. Um, and then finally, eight, nine, 10, eight, is um, as zero to 10 again for sleep, um, brain protection. You know, are your kids wearing a helmet? Are they playing extreme sports? You know, uh, having your brain is very, um, it's very resilient, but it's also very fragile. And uh, my parents immigrated to the US. My dad was 13. You know, our family lived in the back of a laundry mat that my mom worked at. They had many jobs. And so I wasn't uh, very well supervised, which is why I had so many accidents as a kid. Um, my grandmother actually uh, was my caregiver. And when I was going, when I had my accident when I was five years old, uh, she started showing early signs of dementia. And, um, you know, she was my hero. And to see someone that you love, that you spend the most time with, you think the world of, and she calls you by your father's name, um, or she says something that she just said not 30 seconds ago, it put me on this path. Another, you know, kind of, uh, signpost, if you will, in terms of the path I chose to take. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we donated hundred percent of my book limitless, all the author proceeds to charity, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, to Alzheimer's research, uh, specifically for women, because women are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's than men. And yet most of the research is done on male brains, a lot of, you know, most of the treatments on, 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 on male brains. And so I'm very passionate about that. And also building schools. We, we were very fortunate, you know, the past couple of years, we built schools everywhere from uh, Ghana to Guatemala, fully funded this building of the schools and textbooks and teachers and healthcare and clean water that keeps kids from going to school. But those are our two kind of our, you know, things we're most excited about, you know, so at whatever age or stage I could tell you is, um, we we grossly underestimating understanding what our brain is capable of, so but you have to protect that brain. So I'll wear a helmet. Uh, number nine is new learnings, and I'm preaching to the choir uh, to everyone listening. But your brain is like a muscle; it's use it or lose it. Um, if I put my arm in a sling for a year, it wouldn't grow stronger. It wouldn't even stay the same, right? It would atrophy, and uh, and so you want to make sure you exercise your brain. And for me, my favorite exercise I know you're a speed reader is uh, is reading. Right. I, I think reading is to your mind what exercises to your body. And uh, it's my favorite way to, uh, to exercise my mental muscles. And then finally, number 10 is stress management. And this is, you, this is the invisible one because we don't we don't see it, but we feel it for sure. The chronic stress has been proven to re, uh, shrink the human brain. Um, you know, cortisol, adrenaline, you're in that fight or flight. You're not in that kind of parasympathetic rest and digest. And um you know, it's, it's scary, you know, like even with all the fear mongering and, you know, it bleeds, it leads, there's an algorithm in our mind, just like there is in social media, that if uh, whatever you consume on social media, they give you more of. So if you're on Instagram and you just like, share, comment on all the cat videos, right, then they show you more cats and that becomes your reality, right? That becomes your newsfeed. Well, if we're just looking at what's dark and scary in the world all the time, then we're that's what we engage you with, that our minds start seeing more of that. And, uh, you know, our reticular activating system is really charged for, for looking for those things. And, um, and that creates fear and chronic fear actually suppresses the human immune system, makes you more susceptible to colds, the viruses, the flu, whose whole area of science called psychoneuroimmunology. And so, um, you know, how are we managing our stress? How are you coping with stress on a scale of zero to 10? You know, my favorite thing is meditation. I do it twice a day and I have for years. And that allows me, even when I wasn't sleeping, um, to be able to, to keep uh, catch up, keep up and also get ahead. And I use a number of devices that, um, you know, you mentioned also technology to be able to support that kind of parasympathetic, you know, spending more time in that alpha and those, those theta brainwave states. So, um, I don't know. Those are the 10 things that, that really I go to. I want to make sure that those, that those are foundational for me. And, and there are ways of doing these things that are really inexpensive. You know, you get the ways of forming your routines. Uh, you know, if you have kids that you could do it, a lot of these things with your children also as well.
Yeah, I think children are some of the best teachers of that. And I, I think each of these points you mentioned could easily be its own series of podcast episodes because there's so much to learn on each of those. But to highlight a couple that I think really stand out, especially for the parents listening, I've always loved your focus on new learning. And I think that really is what keeps our brains and our our bodies and our minds young. And I think for that reason, having children is amazing because they are our teachers and remembering things like learning new things and play. Yeah. And I know one thing we do in our family is at least every quarter, but usually every month, we have a new sort of family challenge that we take on and, and that usually involves some aspect of learning. So this is involved in the past things like learning how to solve a Rubik's Cube or mm. playing chess or different types of art or new yeah. movement patterns, which have, those are the most challenging for me, not growing up as an athlete and trying to become one as an adult. But I feel like anything we're doing that's challenging our comfort level in our brains has so much payoff in other areas. So that's just something I always encourage families to implement is do these together as a fun family game to learn something new. And often I'm surprised by just how rapidly kids pick these things up. And I'm the one struggling to learn the new language or to relearn how to play the piano as an adult. And they just pick it up so instantly. Yeah. Um, but I'd also love to really delve into the sleep side a little bit more because like you said this is something that you have personally put a lot of dedication toward and improving in your own life mm -hmm. and i would guess because it's a struggle for you you've tried a wide variety of things and probably have some great insight into what works and what doesn't and of course with the caveat that there's personalization in the sleep space sure. as well i know sleep is often a struggle for parents it's often a struggle for kids and as you pointed out so well if we can improve sleep that ripples into all areas of our life. And you mentioned you've improved yours quite drastically in the last few years through things you've done. So any tips maybe yeah. specific to parents that we can do to help our kids develop a really great sleep foundation from a young age? Yeah. And then part of it also, besides I had my family tested also as well, my parents, my siblings, and they all have sleep apnea. So part of it was a genetic um, you know, challenge that we, we collectively needed to be able to overcome. And then part of my sleep issues also came in terms of origin was, um, was was my day to day training because whatever you rehearse, you know, whatever you're doing repeatedly, you get better at. And because I had these learning challenges, it wasn't because I was not willing to work hard. You know, my my parents really instilled that kind of discipline and work ethic, but I could work two or three times harder as the other kids in school for uh, far less grades. And so I was on the other part of the bell curve that made you know those achievers possible. Um, but part of it was I would pull these all all nighters in in high school, you know, in the beginning, you know, freshman year of college before I learned these skills, and that you know was not something great to ingrain early on. Um, you know, I thought I was, uh, you know, I was giving myself an advantage by by working all night, and when it was actually more detrimental. And so I started developing these grooves and these habits uh, in terms of my my sleep hygiene, and that's probably not advantageous. Um, even when I, you know, started teaching this and I started traveling, and I could be on the road more than half of the year, w w you know, waking up in uh, different cities, and it's really bad when you're a memory expert and you forget <laughs> what city that you're actually in that day. Um, but sleeping in foreign environments, like, you know, different hotels, uh, um, you know, jet lag, time zones, all of that. So even as my career, I never had that, um, the consistency of having a sleep sanctuary, right? Um, having certain rituals, um, because the environment definitely gets coded in terms of, of what we're learning. That's why we say don't work in your bed, right? You know, because uh, you start connecting those states, emotional states and moods uh, to that activity. And you wonder why you can't turn your brain off, you know, when you're lying in bed, because uh, really, you know, you've conditioned that environment for that activity. And so that being said, as, as, as background, the foreground in terms of what I do, um, some of the things that move the needle for me. Um, okay, so... I I get direct sunlight first thing in the morning. Um, like I talk about, I, I and this is interesting, some of the stuff I don't talk about, but I, I did an episode recently about uh, elements and it's interesting, elemental, and you, there's the word mental inside of elemental. And, you know, the four elements were like what, you know, thousands of years ago, they thought, you know, think everything was made up of these four elements, right? Earth and fire, uh, you know, uh, uh, water and air. And so, you know, if we're talking about biohacking and biohacking your brain, you know, a lot of it could be done 
uh, inexpensive, if not free. So I try to get incorporate those four elements in my morning routine. So something simple like when I wake up within 15 minutes, I want to go outside, right? And when I'm outside, I get the fresh air, I hydrate. Uh, so I get my, my water because we could lose up to a, a pound of water while we sleep through respiration and perspiration and we know that our brain is, is mostly water and just a drop in in um, hydration could compromise our reaction time and our thinking speed so i'm drinking this water and i'm and i'm literally barefoot in my yard um so i'm getting grounded also as well and i, I watch the sun come up every single morning it's my non-negotiable and i i think uh you know and you, you've heard other experts you know on on your show talk about resetting their uh, circadian rhythm but I just do that and I'm outside for maybe 20 minutes and I haven't touched my phone <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, uh, you hear other people talk about it, but I just don't want to rewire my brain first thing in the morning when I'm in that relaxed state of awareness. I'm very, you know, you're very impressionable. If the first thing you do is pick up your device, you're reprogramming and rewiring your mind for distraction. Every like, share, comment, you know, ring, ping, ding, cat video is, is driving you to distraction. And then we're rewiring our brain also for being reactive Right, you get you get a message on social media, like you know, a comment or something, or a voicemail, and it could just hijack your mood for the day, as opposed to being proactive and designing your day. And so, when I'm outside, I kind of think about, um, and this goes back to sleep, but I, I think about what would it, you know, bringing joy to the process. And I think I'm at the age of my, you know, my career and my life. I just want to bring more joy. I feel like that if you could do what you love or find a way of loving what you do, you could add five days to every week, right? You know, where most people look forward to to the weekends. And so I do this thought experiment every morning while I'm outside and I just, I mentally project to the future. And I, you know, I imagine myself at the end of the day and a family member or friend asks how my day was. And I say, this was amazing. I crushed it today, it was incredible. Then I say, okay, what had to happen in order for me to say those words, in order for me to feel that way? And it usually is not like I did 200 things on my to-do list, but it's usually, you know, three things personally and three things professionally that I want clarity on. I want to be able to hit that target. And um, and besides having you know, that to-do list, I also have like a to-feel list. What are the emotions I want to cultivate today? You know, you mentioned one like curiosity, a level of fun uh, and playfulness because uh, kids are incredibly fast learners because they cultivate those states, you know, and, you know, there's this uh, somebody's mentioned to me at one of the events because I do a lot of games in my in my speeches and our and our training um, that, hey, I stopped playing because I grew older. And I was like, no, you grew older because you stopped playing. Right. And I think. Uh, Chronological age is one thing, but it's you know speaking more about the uh, the age of our mind and uh, the, the age of our spirit or, or our heart, if you will. Um, so in order to be able to win the day, you have to win that first hour of the day, you know, as we we, we know. And so I, getting the the elements first thing in the morning is so important. And then at nighttime, I'll reintroduce those elements also as well. Um, you know, I. I it's funny because it's, you know, like as hunter gatherers, we would know it was time to go to sleep because there would be a drop in two things, a drop in light and a drop in temperature, but modern conveniences, you don't get that, right? You have, uh, you know, the you have modern uh, uh, temperature thermostats, uh, you know, in, in homes nowadays, in most homes, um, you know, and also you have lighting, right? And so we know to, you know, I, I don't go on my device uh, honest truth, uh, the past 90 minutes in a day, I just, I just don't. And not because I'm so enlightened. It's just, I don't, I feel like I'm at a disadvantage if I do that because I, I'm so sensitive to that. Um, you know, we hear about blue light and how it kind of tricks our mind and thinking it's still daytime and we don't produce the melatonin, um, and temperature. Right. And so for, so I have my blackout curtain, so I make it dark, right. Sometimes I use an eye mask if I'm traveling, um, or, uh, for temperature, I, for me, what works is I do my sauna um, more in the afternoon. Uh, that just works for me. Sometimes after a workout also as well. Um, I find I think so well in a sauna. I don't know what it is, but it's, um, and I've, I have a traditional sauna and also a, a sunlight sauna. And um, I feel like I, I come up with my, some of my best ideas there, but I'll, I'll even take a warm bath. Uh, with some Epsom salt, I think the magnesium is it works for me. It moves the needle for me. And when you get out of those, you know, heated environments, your core body temperature drops, and then you know, you produce the melatonin, which triggers that relaxation. Um, and then I also, I, I really wanted going back to bringing more joy into things and and more more fun. Um, I don't want it so structured, just like with my diet, because I find that sometimes when I was 
you know, I've experimented with various diets, almost all of them, you know, over just testing it, you know, in terms of my biology. But I found that was sometimes I was so stressed uh, about what I was eating that it kind of countered any benefit that I was getting. And same thing with sleep. Sometimes when I look at all my devices and I was looking so deeply at my my deep sleep or my REM sleep or my light sleep uh, and measuring every little thing, um, I found for me sometimes it did... Um, that it almost became an obsession and it really added more anxiety to the process. Um, but I, I use, um, you know, a, a pad on my bed going back to temperature. Also, um, some people like their, their, their chili pad, um, or eight sleep or, or what have you. And that's, uh, that's something that works for me also as well. I have a weighted blanket and, you know, I play uh, something on a, a new calm device, uh, for deep sleep, you know, in the background, turn off all the Wi-Fi in, in our home because um, I am sensitive certainly to EMFs uh, for me personally. And um, yeah, I don't do caffeine past noon. Um, I don't eat too close to bedtime either. And I definitely don't work, you know, within, you know, a few hours of going to sleep. But those are some of my kind of my go go to's. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having you on my podcast also to talk about yours because you've probably forgotten more, you know, about these things than most people will ever learn. And so, but sleep is so very, very important. It's got to be the number one brain hack for sure. Yeah, I fully agree. And you just gave so many absolute gold tips right there, I think. And, and I love that you focus on the ones that are inexpensive or free as the mm -hmm. actual core foundational ones. Cause I think often there's a tendency to get swept up in the idea of all these cool new biohacks. But at the end of the day, yeah. to your point, it really goes back to our foundational habits with sleep being sort of the cornerstone. And the ones you mentioned of getting that morning sunlight, there's just continued research showing up that supports that as really an anchor point for your circadian rhythm and your cortisol yeah. and melatonin patterns. And this is very true for kids as well. So I feel like for parents, if you can make this a habit in the morning to get outside with your kids, it's a great time for conversation. If you can be, you know, barefoot on the grass, like you said, even better, but that light, it doesn't have to be an hour. It can be 10 minutes. Yeah. Early morning light makes a huge difference along with um, one tip I tell parents that has made a big difference in our house is to sort of have two separate lights. So the bulbs in our ceiling are daylight bulbs with a broader spectrum of light. And mm -hmm. then we have lamps that are lower down that are warm mm -hmm. red light only with the idea that when the sun sets, it's not even just the color of light. That's important too. We want to reduce the intensity of the light, but we want the level of the light to be more eye level or below because that's what we would experience with campfire, yeah. with sunset, those types of things. Wow. And I find for parents, if you can just build that into your house with timers so you don't have to think about it, yeah. that alone will help your kids be more tired at that time. That's a huge takeaway. I'm I'm going to do that this week, 100%. Um, because I also like, I like looking at the the sun going down also. You know, I make that part of the ritual to to reconnect with family also as as well. But I, I love having uh, the red light actually at a at that angle because that that makes sense to me. I'm gonna definitely test that. Awesome. Let me know how it goes. And and also your tip about not eating too close to bedtime, very important for children as well. Obviously, you don't want them going to bed starving. But if right. you can put a couple hours between food and bedtime, it tends to help everyone sleep a lot better. Um, and I want to also get a chance to delve into some of the more biohacky stuff as well. But I love that these are things anyone can implement mm -hmm. in their home as is. Um, and another one you mentioned earlier that I think is vitally important and often overlooked as well is that social connection aspect. Yeah. Um, I recently had a Harvard researcher on who said in the the longest study of human adult development ever, that was the key takeaway for them, was that our social connections and relationships are the most important factor for longevity, more so than smoking or not, more so than obesity, more so than what we eat. And I feel like many people are suffering in this area after the last few years. Um, and so to your point, if you guys can be the initiator and be the one who starts this and establishes those social bonds and makes it a regular habit. I think not only is that one of the best things we can do for our own health, but modeling that for our kids can help them have that foundational aspect in their lives as well. I love that so much. Even, even that, you know, having family meals, right. Um, you know, that was something that I was, you know, very fortunate, even though my parents were gone, you know, before I woke up uh, to go to work and everything. And then, but they would always come back uh, for, for dinner and having those family meals or some of my, you know, uh, some of my core memories with, without a doubt, I would also say it's not just what we eat, it's how we eat and who we're eating with, right. And why we're eating those things. Um, you know, instead of watching, you know, binge watching something while you eat, you know, you actually 
being conscious and mindful of that process. Like mindfulness doesn't have to be just limited to our meditation time, you know, our white space time, but it could also be being mindful when we're brushing our teeth or mindful when we're, you know, chewing. Most people don't, chewing is like a lost art nowadays, you know, but, you know, we know that our, our stomach doesn't have anything mechanical to break down foods, right? It's, it's more chemical, but it, you know, but obviously it'd be wonderful to be able to, to take um, more, more bites, if you will. And, and chew our food. And so it's even more easily digestible. Um, and I think that that's really important, you know, where, where we're even we're talking about, you know, uh, not just what, but how, uh, who, you know, where we're eating also as, as well, and when we're eating. And so, you know, I, I don't want it to be hungry or you don't want your kids to be hungry as a distraction, just like cold. Like I want to make it cold, but I don't want it to be so cold that it's distracting me from sleeping, right? It's keeping me from, from sleeping also as well, but finding that not even balance, finding that harmony, you know, it's for me, it's not about so much life balance, balance. It's interesting. Words have a, an effect on our nervous system, how we process it. Balance, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says equal amounts of, and I don't, you know, it feels like I'm on a balance beam and that's very stressful for me uh, that at any moment you could kind of tip or, or, or fall off. And, you know, I don't want to spend equal amount working as I do, you know, equal amount of time working out. Um, but I think uh, if you, my metaphor and we, it's part of how we learn and we teach kids is through metaphors and parables and, and stories is like more like a symphony, like an orchestra, you know, and not every uh, instrument plays an equal amount of time, but they come in and they add their unique value, their, their unique ability, their superpower, and uh, and they create art, you know, as well. So it's, I think there's a science to learning, a science to living, but I think there's also equally important, there's an art and a creativity, imagination. Even when I'm reading, I read, I used to read exclusively nonfiction, um, you know, uh, uh, for four years, I read a book a day, uh, and we've talked about speed reading and stuff like that in, in a previous episode together. Um, but I would I stay away from fiction. But the past 10 years, I'm reading almost an equal amount of fiction. And fiction is, is what I read at night. I never want to get all heady in my mind and, and do critical thinking and read neuroscience or, or uh, entrepreneur's content before I go to bed, because that kind of puts me in my uh, prefrontal cortex, but I, I like reading more fiction. And it's funny because nonfiction, you're learning primarily through uh, information. Fiction, you're learning through through imagination, you know, instead of information. And obviously it takes imagination to write good nonfiction. And I, I know you're, you're a best-selling author and you know that. And also fiction obviously has information in it as well. But um, fiction reading has been shown to, to improve EQ right? Our emotional quotient uh, to enhance empathy, uh, to help you see from different points of views, uh, to understand storytelling, uh, to be able to boost uh, the things that are truly limitless, our creativity, our imagination, and so much more. So on the on my nightstand, I have, I have a journal because uh, I feel like it's important for me to get things out of my mind. Um, so I don't put energy towards it. I, I, I write down my dreams as part of it. I write down my gratitude because those emotional states are important for me to get into that parasympathetic kind of rest and digest. Um, I have a, a glass of water there and that's more because I don't drink it at night because uh, I don't want to use the, the restroom uh, and wake up doing that. But, um, but I'll, I'll drink it, you know, in the morning. And I feel like you have to set your environment up, even with your kids to be able what's good for you, you want to make it easier. And the things that are not so good for you, you want to make it more difficult. So I don't have my phone in, in the, in the bedroom because I just want, and it's not, so it has nothing to do with willpower, but if I control, if I put it into my, my bathroom, I won't, I won't touch it, you know, first, first thing in the morning. So I want to make it more difficult to do the things that are probably not the best, you know, for me. So I have my journal on my nightstand, going back to sleep. I have a glass of water and I have, um, I have my aura ring charger and then I have um, a fiction book, you know, and sometimes it's a comic book, you know, I, I, we've talked about this, how I love superheroes and, you know, I used to escape when I was being bullied, you know, in, in my imagination and not feeling like I wasn't enough. It allowed me to, to realize that, you know, we're all on this hero's journey. And even if you see the opening cover of Limitless, I, I break it down the book based on uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey also as well. Um, so I'm a big lover of, of, of that. So, and it brings me joy. It makes me feel like a kid again. And I think those are good states to cultivate when I want to be able to, you know, have a safe place to be able to, to be able to fall asleep. 
like you, I focused on nonfiction for a very long time. And I feel like my kids were great teachers in learning to love fiction and even superhero stories and movies a lot more. And I think kids yeah. are so great at that imagination piece that you mentioned that we can learn so much from them. We often as adults want to default to that more information-based learning, but I feel like if we can get more in that childlike curiosity and playfulness and imagination space, that's how, to me, retention really goes up when you're able to be in that zone. And I want to circle back to a comment you made earlier. You talked about if we fight for our limitations, we get to keep them. And this has been one of my personal lessons in the last couple of years is just how profoundly our inner thoughts and our inner talk really affects our physical health, our mental health, so many aspects of life. I think it's also a challenging one for a lot of people to even first become aware of, and then secondly, to start to cultivate better. So I'm curious if you have any tips for people in sort of curating and cultivating healthier inner talk and habits that way. Yeah, I think, um, and everyone's different, just like when it comes to food or sleep, some things that move the needle. For, for me, I think self-awareness is a superpower. So I always start with um, meta thinking is thinking about our own thinking. So just that awareness that we do have this inner talk that's there um, is the first part of making any kind of change because you can't change something unless you, know, you make it more explicit. Um, I'm a big person that advocates for writing things down because I think it's the first step in creation, the creative process where you take something that literally is invisible and you make it visible, you know, and so it's something you made it something outside of you. And if you could do that, what else can you build on that? Um, you know, changing the words make a big difference for a lot of people, meaning sometimes people have this inner talk about, Oh, I, I got to pick up the kids today. I got to work out. Oh, goodness. Like, I got to meditate. And just changing like a word from got to get, <laughs> you know, one little uh, letter, you change it from an O to an E. I get to pick up my kids today. I, I get to move and work out today. You know, I, I, I get to study or I get to prepare for this meeting or whatever. I get to meditate. It just changes. You know, I, I think the problem is rarely the problem. I think the problem is usually our attitude about the problem. And I think, again, you know, if I think about a dominant question, like how can I bring more joy to this? Um, how can I be more, you know, what do I have to be grateful for in this moment? And not that as, you know, a magic pill, but it does redirect our focus. I mentioned earlier that reticular activating system, that RAS, that our brain is mostly a deletion device. It's actually at any given time, there's a billion, two billion different stimuli that we could be focusing on. Um, so our brain is mostly trying to keep information out because we would be overloaded and overwhelmed. Um, and when we let in uh, things that our reticular activating system deems something important, like our name. That's why, you know, I could be running a marathon in, in DC. I remember actually doing this. I was running the Marine Corps marathon and somebody yelled out my name and I know I didn't like Jim, uh, and it's obviously a very common name. So I know I didn't know the person, but instinctively I had to pause and look um, because you know that I've trained you've trained your nervous system to pay attention to things that are important. Um, and so you know, asking certain questions will shine a spotlight on the thing that um, that you're looking for. And I feel like we have to control those uh, questions because that's the questions determine our attention. That is attention is going to determine how we feel. And then how we feel is going to determine what we do and how we experience things in our life. And so um, we have about 50, 60, 70 thoughts, 70,000 thoughts a day. And a lot of those thoughts come in the form of, of questions. And so, um, you know, changing a simple question uh, from like, why does this happen to me? Or why can't I ever... Uh, learn this or wow, can I never like lose this weight or whatever it is, maybe we could come up with something like, how do I, how do I make this, uh, how do I do this and, and find joy in the process, right? What is the best use of, of this moment? Well, I'm, you know, question I ask a lot is even when it comes to our own self-talk is like, I'm looking at my to-do list and I say, oh my God, I feel so overloaded. And that's my, you know, and those thoughts affect me like those automatic negative thoughts. And I just say like, okay, what on this list here that if I did, would make everything else easier or even make the rest of this stuff almost you know obsolete if i did this thing right because it's not even about time management right i was thinking about this the other day it's in order that not everybody has equal right there's there's not equal not everyone makes the same amount of money not everyone has the same rolodex or i'm dating myself rolodex like the amount of network or contacts not everybody has the same level of education but we all have 24 hours in a day um, but it's not even about time management it's about mind management. It's about even priority management, you know, and I always think that the most important thing 
is to keep the most important things, the most important things, that the most important things keep the most important thing or things, the most important thing or things. Um, Cause we never want to do the things that don't matter. Right. And so, you know, I've heard you talk about it on your podcast, um, you know, the Pareto's principle, the 80, 20 rule, you know, obsessed about finding that 10 or 20% of the things that really move, that give me the most kind of return because I had to, when I was like, especially not sleeping. And so uh, when it comes to our negative self-talk, first be aware of it. And then even if we find ourselves saying something, um, I would always say like, I would do like a redo <laughs> and you could have like a, you know, like maybe put a little bit of music or cartoon music in the background and kind of rewind it and then say something else that is uh, more aligned and more powerful. Even when I feel stressed, I did a podcast uh, called Abra because Abra, I love magic. I, I learned those techniques on how to memorize a list full of random words, you know, in and out of order through a magician. Um, and I, but the difference is when I asked him, can I teach this? He was like, yeah, sure, share, share with whoever. I don't think he realized how many people I would share with, but I realized that there's a method behind what looks like magic, um, that genius leaves clues. And, um, and you could do some remarkable things, but you could organize, organize your mind. Um, and then also the last thing I would say when it comes to your negative self-talk, so the, there's four, like ABRA is an acronym because I use these mnemonics even as I teach it. Um, the A is you acknowledge that negative phrase that you just said. You acknowledge it. You don't resist it because what you resist persists. If I say, don't think about this, you're just going to think about it more. So you, you acknowledge it. Uh, the B is I tend to breathe into it. So I imagine where in my body. So if I feel angst or I have a thought, I, I would say, okay. I, I, like I, maybe a pain somewhere, uh, I acknowledge it, the A, and I breathe into it, right? And this could be not a physical pain, it could be a pain and a splinter in my mind. And I would acknowledge it, breathe into it. Um, the R is I would release it. So with my exhale, I would release that thing that I would normally complain about or make an excuse about. Or um, And then the A is I align, I realign to my truth, which is usually opposite of what, you know, that negative thought is or was. Um, yeah. And so I think we're all here because we want to make some kind of change. People are listening to this right now because they, they want to make some kind of change, but change in our nervous system is sometimes hard because our nervous system really is wired to grow until we experience some kind of trauma. And then our, our nervous system really wants to keep us safe. Right. And so, you know, uncertainty or, or change could be a danger. Right. And, and that's how, you know, uh, one theory of how we're organized but there's only four different ways to, to make a change, right? And you either want to do more of something. Um, you know, I met, let's say someone meditates once a week, they want to do more of it, maybe get up to twice a week, or they want to exercise three times a week instead of once. You know, you could do more of something. The second thing you could do is do less of something, you know, and so maybe you want to spend less time uh, on your phone or less time, you know, binge watching that, that show. Um, and I'm, this is not a judgment on those activities. If you're getting the result that you want, that's great. But if you're complaining about it, we can't be upset by the results we didn't get from the work we didn't do. And that's just the kind of the coach of me coming out, you know, because I think a coach is there to challenge you to make some positive change. But you could do more of something or you could do less of something. And for me, it's very binary or you could do you could start something. Right. And so maybe you've been, you know, hesitant to ever meditate. You think it's something that you have to quiet your mind, which is absolutely not true. You can't stop your mind from thinking any more than you could stop your heart from beating. That's what it does. Right. But um, maybe that's kept you from it. But maybe you want to start something. And my recommendation is start somewhere, anywhere, but start small. Maybe it's not uh, working out an hour a day. If you've never done it before, maybe it's getting on your running shoes. Right. Maybe if your kids uh, don't floss their teeth, which we know oral hygiene is very important um, for, for longevity, maybe get them to floss one tooth because nobody's going to stop there. Maybe that maybe your kids aren't reading, um, you know, for 30 minutes a day. If people have seen me on social media with Elon or Oprah or whoever, like people ask, like, how did you meet? We bonded over books. Right. You read to succeed. If somebody has decades of experience like you do and you put it into a book, you know, which you've done multiple times. And you, somebody sit down and read that book, they could download decades of experience into days, you know, and that's an incredible um, way of cutting the learning curve. The challenge is, is if like a child's not studying, then maybe, you know, reading an hour is too hard or 30 minutes too hard, maybe getting them to open up the book or reading one line in the book, right? Mm -hmm. Little by little, a little becomes a lot. So you could do more of something, the only four ways you could change something, you could do more of it, you could do less of it, you could start something new, uh, or you could stop something. Right. And, you know, Bruce Lee has that quote saying, um, you know, where you hack away at the unessentials and, um, 
And I would say that maybe there's something in your life that you just want to, to stop. I, I would say stop, you know, touching your phone for 30 minutes a day and see how that goes. Um, stop complaining, stop making excuses, those kind of things frees up a lot of energy and, you know, power and attention towards things that, you know, you could do to, to make things better. Um, is, and the fifth way is just continuing what you're doing. But if you're continuing what you're doing and not getting the result, we all know the definition of insanity. Um, but I also think that whatever we're not changing, we're choosing. <laughs> Um, so if we're not getting the result that we want and we're not, there's a quote in Limitless from a French philosopher uh, that gets shared a lot. Um, and it says, life is the C between B and D. Life is the letter C between the letters B and D. B stands for birth. D stands for death. Life, C, choice. That uh, I believe that we are the sum total of all the choices we've made up to this point, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, what are we going to eat today? Where are we going to live? Who are we going to spend time with? All the things we, you know, talked about. Um, but, you know, when it comes to choices, I believe that these difficult times, they could distract us. These difficult times can diminish us or these difficult times, they could develop us. But we we always decide. And I think one of the most important things with, with kids is reminding them of their own agency and their own uh, responsibility. I mentioned this in, in the podcast that we did um, years ago, introducing, um, uh, I was going out to dinner with Stan Lee and Stan is like the the person I wanted to you know meet and spend time with. And uh, he wanted to meet another individual and uh, I pick him up and I had to ask him, I was like, you know, you've, you made all my favorite superheroes, but who's your favorite? And he says, Jim, my favorite is Iron Man. And he says, uh, Jim, who's your favorite? And he had the Spider-Man tie on and I said, Spider-Man. And he, without a pause in his iconic voice, he goes with great power comes great responsibility. Right. And we all know that, but um, I don't know if it's because of the injuries I had um, to my brain early on, but I tend, even when I read or hear something, I tend to reverse things pretty often. And uh, I heard something different. I was like, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And Stan, the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. When we take responsibility for something, we have great power to make it better. Um, and, you know, that's what I would probably tell like the 10 year old, you know, little Jim, you know, that, you know, we are responsible, that maybe our environment and our experience shaped us where we are, but we are hundred percent responsible, you know, for today and, and tomorrow. Oh, so many things within that, that could be their own entire episode, but I love the focus of reading. I think of Naval's quote that read what you love until you learn to love to read. And I think of your story and comic books being such great teachers for you. And I think often parents want their kids to read school books or specific books that they think are going to help teach them specific lessons. But I think mm -hmm. circle back that imagination, whatever story they love can be such a teaching tool. And that's a lesson for adults as well. Um, I love the reversal of that Spider-Man quote. It's something I say to my children often. Also in parenting them is that if you want great freedom, great power, but that comes with great responsibility. And to the yeah. degree that you show me you're responsible, I have no desire to restrict your freedom and your power. Yeah. Um, I also love how you talked about those internal statements and questions we make. I think this might be the most pivotal thing I've done for myself in the past five years is learning to change those things. Like to your point, instead of why can't I lose weight to a how question of how can I make this so fun and so easy? Yeah. Um, I think there's also a special power behind any statement that starts with I am. And so I stopped saying I am sick and I started saying I am healing. I think mm. little things like that, that seem so small really do have such such a big payoff over time. And that's something that is a slow process to learn, but pays dividends throughout life. Yeah. And especially if we can teach that to our kids as they're young, uh, it's such a superpower to them. And I know I could learn from you all day long and I hope we will do many, many more episodes together. I'll also link in the show notes to all of your books and your courses, which I highly recommend. We use them as part of our homeschool program, actually, yeah. because of this idea that learning and love of learning is a superpower and you encompass this in such fun ways that we've done as a family. So, so much gratitude to you for that. Um, but a couple last questions for this episode before we hopefully do yeah. many more rounds. The first being, you're such an avid reader. Are there yeah. any recent or ever books that have had a really profound impact on you that you would recommend? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I read every single day. It's just, I, I run and I read. That That's my thing. I have to do something physical and something mental. Um, goodness, some books that 
really changed my life early on. Um, I got on this path when I was 18 years old. Uh, a mentor gave me a number of books to read um, and challenged me to read one book a, a week. And some of those books were very early personal growth books. So some of those iconic books were like by Napoleon Hill, uh, like Think and Grow Rich, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking, um, you know, iconic books that I that I've read, you know, more recently, or, you know, we were are preparing for for podcasts. You know, I like to read the books of, you know, our guests, um, so I could be intelligent, um, and, and learn also as well. And, um, and it's wonderful. I, I think it's, you know, the fact that you have hosted and you've had so many episodes and you've had, you've been blogging for years before people were blogging and you have this, you know, big on the presence, uh, you do it because of what you learn, but you also do it of how you could share with, with other people, you know, also as well. And so I, I have a to-do list, but I also have a not to-do list. And I also have a to-read list. <laughs> I could look at my shelves and I don't know if, uh, I mean, I'm surrounded by, I could show you like every, like I have books upon books upon books like on every wall in this in this um in this office and I have a full out library um just adjacent to this because I do a lot of reading and research you know also as well um but uh some of the iconic books I'll, I'll mention are things like uh like mindset by Carol Dweck, uh, which which is uh, you know very amazing. Um, I did a deep dive when I was writing the book on flow states, so I did a lot. Um, of uh, of reading in that area, especially by our, our friend Stephen Kotler. So uh, things like um, his Superman book, which is absolutely amazing, or Stealing Fire. Um, those flow states is something that I um, I want to be able to explore. You know, also also as much as well. So, but there's so many amazing works out there. I will link to those in the show notes as well. Yeah. Of course, your books do. And uh, I know you read so much and you have met so many people. So I'm really excited for the answer to this, this question, which is any parting advice for the listeners today that could be related to everything we've talked about, or it could be entirely unrelated. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, um, Dr. A, a couple of quick things. So uh, Dr. Amen has this, uh, you know, dominant question where he asks all the time. Um, many people know his book, uh, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, which I would add to that list also as well. He's written like 40 plus books on, on the brain and he's done a quarter million brain scans and, you know, including mine also as well. And I always wear a brain on my chest. If you're watching this on video or on social media, I always point to my brain because I think what you see, you take care of. You know, you see your hair, you see your skin, uh, you see your car, your clothes, you tend to take care of the things because it's your constant awareness, but we don't see the thing that takes care of us, <laughs> which which is our brain. So I'm always wearing it on my apparel and, you know, we, we, we make this merch uh, and we give it, you know, the, all the profits to charity um, for brain health uh, and awareness. But I just, when it, he has this question where he says, is it good for my brain or is this bad for my brain? And I'm like, wow, that's really simple. And it's often the simple fundamentals, you know, the people are really amazing what they do, the professionals, uh, the quote unquote masters or experts, they never get bored of the basics. Um, and so for me, my parting words would be to, I want people to know their brain. I want people, because if you want to improve your self-esteem overnight, just study how magnificent, you know, the, these 87 billion neurons really are, you know, which each have like upwards of 10,000 synapses, which are, if you make those connections, more stars in the known universe. I mean, we are, we are, I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, and no brain is, uh, you know, exactly alike. So I find that incredible because that's, what's limitless, right? It's, you know, it's limitless. It's not about being perfect. It's about advancing and progressing beyond what we believe is possible, but there's no limit to our creativity. There's no limit to our ability to come together in, in hard times. There's no lim limit to our ability to imagine a you know, brighter and more aspiring future uh, for ourselves. And so I would say, number one, know your brain, um, you know, trust your brain, love your brain, and, and mostly use your brain. You know, sometimes we get mentally lazy for things. And I think that hard work sometimes is a lost art. I think part of it is chopping wood and carrying water and doing those fundamental things that cause effort, you know, even with, with our children, you know, getting them to know that not everything is supposed to be easy, that adversity could be an advantage. You know, if you will look at the word disadvantage, there's still the word advantage, you know, built into it. And I find that with struggles come strengths. So my message is, is that people right now, somebody's listening to this and they're struggling right now, um, that I would say that, you know, that they inspire people 
you know, with their grit, you're inspiring somebody with your grace, that the life we live are the lessons we teach, you know, when we're talking about congruency. And, and I'm just saying that there's a version of ourself that's patiently waiting. And the goal is we show up every single day until we're introduced, you know, like I got this question in, in a recent media interview, they're like, let's say Jim, like there's one who's one or two people you want to make proud. And a lot of people say, well, it'd be my, my parents and make my kids, it'd be my mentor. That, that's actually not what came to my mind. I mean, I, I hope that's the case, but I don't have control over that. But, um, you know, for me, I want to make that, that nine-year-old boy that was labeled broken. I want, I want to make him proud, you know, and then fast forward because I hope to live a good amount of time. I'm looking at that 90 year old version of me and just saying, you know, I want to, I want to make him proud also as well. Cause I think the life we live are again, are the lessons we teach, you know, to our kids, to our friends, to our family and, and the people who are blessed to be around. I love that. And I think a perfect place to wrap up for today. But like I said, I hope there are many more episodes to come. You're yeah. one of my favorite people to talk to. And I feel like your heart is as big or even bigger than your brain, which is a huge statement yeah. because you teach so many, so many incredible things. And as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Jim. I'm deeply grateful for your time. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Katie. And thanks as always to all of you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources your time, your energy, and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.